This is the Tech Start Podcast. Tech professionals, remote workers, and entrepreneurs who are leaving the rat race and starting a new life in Southern Colorado. Welcome to the show. I'm here with my co-host, Ash Arnold, and today we've got our guest, Gregory Carlson, on the show with us. Uh, Gregory, welcome to the show. It's an honor to have you here. Thanks so much. Great to be here. Can you hear me okay? Yep. We got you just fine. Fine and clear. So I wanted to start out a little bit with, with your story, um, and, and you're working on some fairly interesting, a fairly interesting project here um, with, with your company, Blickle. Why don't you just open up just telling us briefly, what is, what is Blickle, and uh, just tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, well, I, I've always, ever since I was a kid, I've always had an inclination to, towards teaching. And uh, ever since I was in high school and even earlier, I would love to help people learn math, uh, math came fairly easily to me, and I really enjoyed it. And so I, I wanted to help other people learn math. And even in high school, I could see myself being a math teacher someday. And I went to CU Boulder and uh, was an undergrad teaching assistant and uh, got my degrees in math and economics. And uh, immediately after college, I was accepted into Teach for America. And I taught two years of high school math in New Mexico, in, in rural New Mexico, Grants, actually. And Every time I was teaching in a classroom, although I enjoyed it, I always had this nagging thing in the back of my mind of I could be teaching so many more people right now than just this one classroom. And after that, I came back to Canyon City, and I've been teaching as an adjunct math instructor at the local community college, Pueblo Community College. And through all of that teaching experience at all levels of education, I've used a bunch of different learning systems, and I found that many of them were very difficult to use, and I always wondered how it would be like if I could have my own learning system where I could make my own content. And that's kind of what sparked the idea for Blickle. And we started by making just a simple little programming game that teaches basic programming. And in the first month, it had over 100,000 plays and uh, got very, very positive feedback. And so we took that idea and for the last four years have been building it up. Initially, it was going to be a website to just teach math. And then we realized, well, what if we opened up the platform so that anybody could make any content on any subject? And that idea is what finally evolved into Blickle. Uh, it's a platform where people can make educational content and then share it very easily. And uh, we're actually looking to release it in the next couple weeks. There's a few more things we're polishing up. We're really excited about it, and we're excited to have people start really engaging with it and seeing what they can use it for. That's fantastic. So one of the, one of the things that I find interesting about this is like I, actually I think one thing interesting to, to touch on just on the on the product is that you it, you kind of combine this gamification with instant feedback into the learning process. That's right. Um, the original programming game was actually like an RPG where you're playing your character in the game, and as you're learning content, uh, your character gets stronger because your character is a programmer and uh, can fight more and more difficult bugs. And, uh, and, and so it's kind of like a Pokemon game almost. And, um, yep. and people liked that. But interestingly, we found that a lot of people, because I can look at the analytics, a lot of people ignored those parts of the game and just focused on the learning. Because, and that's something that we've tried to take into account is while the gamification is fun and can add on to it, at the core, people have to feel like they're learning to, keep, to yep. want to keep going. And, yep. uh, and breaking them into pieces is one way to do that. Sure, sure. Where they where they can feel the progress of of, of moving along. Mm -hmm. So something interesting. And that, now, from from where you started back when this was kind of a uh, the, the the dream as a as a kid of hey I could teach, and then kind of this realization hey I could teach even more people. Uh, between between there and where you're at, there have certainly been some bumps in the road. It probably has it it hasn't been easy getting from from where you're at. You know, you know, from there to where you're at. Do you want to talk That's about right. some of the challenges that, that you've faced along the way? Absolutely. We, I've overcome several challenges. I, I think teachers, especially middle, all teachers really, but my experience was at the high school and a little bit at the middle school level, it's getting increasingly difficult to teach because hmm. the, the, the standards are, are high and the students come into your class usually behind and it's up to you to try to get them to the line. And 
I, I would argue that people's attention, attention spans are getting shorter and shorter because of the internet. And uh, it, it is a real challenge. In terms of Blickle, um, I'm a self-taught coder. And um, the, that is, coding in general is a very difficult thing to learn in the beginning. And when I made the programming game, it, what my, my, my uh, mission was to create the game that I wished that I had had when I was learning how to code. <laughs> and, um, and so we had written the original game and uh, the, the original project was written in Flash in uh, ActionScript. And uh, that's because that's the only language I knew at the time. And then one of the, uh, uh, Adobe announced that they're no longer going to support Flash. And initially, that was a real setback. But the truth is, is it's the best thing that happened to us because then we were able to write it in better languages that are more suitable to browsers and phones. And, and so if, if I had it, uh, to add it all up, I think we've probably nearly given up, I would say definitely two times, probably three. And, uh, but we've kept going. We kept the eye on the prize. And uh, I, I, I'm so excited to be where we are right now. <laughs> Super awesome. I'm curious, I'm curious in those times when you wanted to give up, was there, was there anything in particular that kind of made you, I don't, I don't know, dig in your heels, grit your teeth, or, or, or lift your head up a little bit and say, hey, maybe, there's, maybe this actually can work? The, the first one was definitely when we knew that it wasn't going to be able to be written in Flash. And yeah. luckily, translating it to JavaScript turned out to be much easier than I thought it would be. The second real part that I was worried about was learning how to do backend or server coding um, yeah. because I didn't know anything about it at all. And it, it turns out that you know once you know one programming language, it's it's much easier to pick up a second one. Yeah. And so yeah. it turned out that learning that step at a time wasn't as challenging as I thought it would be. And then there's just times where just the site doesn't seem to work. I mean, we've been working on this almost every day for four years. And so you, you do go through phases where you're like, oh, is it ever going to be done? Is it ever going to be ready? And so, you, but you got to just keep pushing ahead. Yep, keep going. It's interesting to hear you talk too, just about the kind of the personal impact of when, when you were talking about the, the challenges going into the classroom, having kids behind, um, you know, needing to meet the standards. That was that was something that was very real for you. I mean, I can hear that in your voice. Yeah, it's, you know, when, when you're a teacher, it's not a number, you know, it's, it's a student and they have a future. And in New Mexico, you have to pass the math test in order to graduate. And so for me, it was, and, and you take it your junior year. And so for me, it's, you know, this is somebody who could be a high school graduate and get on a much better track for life or somebody who uh, um, it will have a much tougher time. I mean, they, and they can still get their GED, but it's so much easier if you can get your high school diploma. You know, I get some really nice messages, even to this day, on my original programming game. I got one just the other day who said that he played my game. He's in another country. I don't remember which one. I think in Europe. And he said he played my game when he was 13 years old, and it got him interested in learning computer code. And he just sent me a message about a week ago, two weeks ago, saying that he's actually majoring in computer science and that my little programming game had such a big impact on his life that it actually made him choose what his major was in college. <laughs> and wow. so those kinds of messages, those kinds of messages, when you are feeling down, those are the kinds of things that make you say, you know, this is worth it. It's worth trying to finish this and for the positive impact it could have on people. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> That's the kind of thing you just want to print out and, and uh, hang on your wall. Uh, I have actually, in fact. Done you have. That. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow! So now you could be you you could have been doing this from from anywhere. Um, I'm I'm kind of curious why. And certainly there were there were plenty of opportunities for you um, with with your skills. I'm curious what what actually brought you back to to Canyon City and back to Fremont County. Well, at first, it, it kind of just evolved on its own. Because you have to remember, I started from zero. I, I, I've never taken a computer programming class before. And so I, I could have gone to one of those dev boot camps that they have, and maybe, maybe that would have been beneficial. Um, but I, I really enjoyed learning on my own. And uh, so part of the reason for staying in a place like Canyon City, first of all, is just financial. 
Um, yeah. and, uh, and I say that not just because it's cheap here, but the fact that it's cheaper here, <clears throat> excuse me, has enabled me to bootstrap the whole project. So we, we own a hundred percent of the company, which has been extremely nice. And um, surely someday we'll get some investors probably someday soon when they can see what the product is capable of. So we've just been, I mean, certainly we could have been in Boulder or Denver and done the venture capitalist route, but that's instead we just decided to, you know, I, I just love my commute. It's 10 minutes on my bike is my commute. I, I'm somebody who doesn't like driving very much anyway. And so it's just wonderful for me to just be able to ride my bike to work and, and just know that the people around me are all really invested. And of course, technology means you can work from anywhere. So it's, it's perfect. Yeah, totally. Well, it, I mean, I, th I think that's worth that's worth thinking about because it, had you given up, had you given up stake in your in your company early on, I mean, you're you're here in Canyon. You can you can work uh, 80, 90 hour weeks if you want to, but that's that's based on your choice. That's right, and and you can you can the, the hours add up. And right now I teach one day a week at the college, but if you, if you're doing a one and a half hour commute every day, those hours add up and they usually yep. reduce your effectiveness. I, I feel really lucky because I'm in a place where I have teaching experience. I, I'm in the middle of a Venn diagram of having t the teacher experience because um, being learning how to code and also knowing the game aspects, growing up playing video games and knowing the kinds of tools that you can have to make a game more fun or more engaging. And yeah. I, I think being in the mid, because I, I actually have a master's degree in secondary education and many of the, the things I learned along uh, getting my master's were implementing into Blickle because uh, I really think that we don't teach math the right way. And part of that is because there's, incentives that make it difficult to teach math the right way. And that's really something we're going to be testing in Blickle is, is this the right way to teach math? And the fun part about the platform is that really the platform is kind of uh, non-biased as to how you're going to teach something. And we'll be able to measure, you know, question to question, which methods are more effective and which are not as effective. Yeah. So do you want to just touch briefly on, on, what are some of the some of the different ways of teaching and can can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, I can give a couple practical examples. One one problem that I can think of immediately is the part of the reason so in general math teachers in middle and high school have many students that they're trying to get caught up so that they can learn to the standard, learn to their grade level. And what that means is you're constantly rushing to the next topic. And one problem I think we have in education, especially in math, is as soon as we've mastered something or we think we have, we're immediately moving to the next topic. And really what we should be doing is once we've mastered it, we should practice that same skill again and again until we really have mastered it and then move on. When I was teaching in high school, I sometimes lost that entire week because I got through my week's curriculum and started the next week and realized we were back at square one because... The students just had not understood it. And so we need to slow down a little bit. Another uh, example too is when you're teaching math, you have to go to where your students are to lift them up. Um, um, when I sit down with the students, in about 10 questions of me asking them various questions, I can pretty quickly determine what their level is, um, whether it's algebra, more advanced algebra, geometry, or even calculus. And you have to find where their level is before you can start building onto them. And unfortunately, there's sometimes pressure to get that student with the C minus to move up to the next math class. But really, what they should be doing is taking that math class over again so that they can have momentum going into the next math class. Um, even with the college, we're getting rid of some of our lower level prereqs for math because they don't count as college credit. And that's going to be real challenging for teachers because uh, it, it, it's, it's impossible to teach calculus to somebody who doesn't have the basics of algebra down. Um, another example of, and, that, and this will be my last one, of trying to, I, that I think is a better way of teaching math is to, you know, and this is, and again, it's hard to teach this way because you need a really strong lesson plan. 
and also it, it takes longer. And so your incentive is to, you're incentivized as a teacher to just want to teach the students the formula, give them 10 examples, and then have them do the formula on their own. And unfortunately, there's entire math classes structured around this kind of teaching. And that's good in the short term, but it can kill somebody's curiosity in math. They see math as work instead of something that can be studied. And so if instead you can ask the question of what problem is there in the world that needs a solution and let the math develop naturally out of coming to the answer of that question and then combining that with the more formal rules, that, that can lead to a much long-term uh, growth in the students and curiosity in the student. And, but unfortunately, it takes time and you need really strong lesson plans. But those are the kinds of things we're building into Blickle so that the teacher can spend more time with their students and less time doing things like grading. Sure. Gregory, I do, I do, it's, it's Ashley, I do have a question for you. Um, they, they say, I think there's a lot of statistics I've read probably over the last maybe three years um, about big data and data science moving and like the top jobs to get are in data science and also in uh, being a statistician, right? As far as your experience with math and whatnot, what's your outlook on that? And in, in the dance between that and coding. That's a really good question, and it's it's nice to uh, meet see you again, Ashley. Um, in my experience with education, especially at the high school level, there was a lot of data that was generated, but very little actual data analysis. And I mean, we did tons and tons of testing. Uh, we were going through this testing fad at the time, where everywhere, where I was literally needing to give students testing. Two, at least two times per week, sometimes three. And it was generating all of this data, but we weren't, we weren't doing anything with it. And the trouble with education data, in education, you have your standards that you're supposed to get the students to master. And the current standards that are throughout the United States are called the Common Core Standards. And those are great, right. but the trouble is that the, the, the devil is in the, the test because you can have a lofty standard and 10 different teachers could interpret that standard 10 different ways and write 10 different questions to test that standard. And so what, what we try to do with Blickle is say, you know, the standard is nice, but we're more focused on the question. What are we actually really, when you get down into it, what are we actually asking the student to do? And every question we generate on Blickle has a very, very specific nature to it. So you can very quickly, it's beyond the student can master fractions and use fractions in applications. That might be a, a standard. We ask questions like, can the student reduce the fraction if the fraction is between 30 over 48 and 162 over 320? You know, you can ask a very specific question. We actually have 60 lessons just on fractions because there's so much packed into understanding fractions. And what's nice is if you let a student take a test, you can see how they do and see exactly where their gaps are so that they can go in and fill those gaps. So I think it's, I think it's exciting where the data can go. And as I said, what I'm actually more interested in beyond just following the data for a single student is figuring out how to combine this with AI and figure out which trends work for different students because those two students learn the same way and there's many different intelligences, and it'll be very interesting to see if certain paths that we can create on the system will lend themselves to certain learning styles. Well, and I think, I think that's a brilliant way of teaching it, and the reason I want to hone in on that is because I think there's a misnomer going on in technology overall. When you look at data science and you look at, at being you know, having having the qualifications to to understand the statistics involved in data science as a whole, what happens is is you get a lot of people, uh, professionals that understand the math, but not necessarily the trade of what they're looking at, the business, right? But on the flip mm -hmm. side, what what you see with data science and what you see with big data analytics and, and, and people having to make decisions driven off this information, which is really interesting because, you know, to, to, to prepare a workforce for it is really kind of hard to do, I think, because what happens is is that 
they can't execute what's happening with the data um, so much. And mm -hmm. what's interesting about how you're kind of teaching it is you you might be able to expose the gap because it's kind of looking at macro analytics but understanding micro math. Does that make sense? At least my view of it in some yes. terms. And it seems like you're actually offering an application that would kind of bridge that gap between business and, and analytics, right? I 100% I believe that. And, to, to, and it'll be to the extent that, you know, just by simply averaging how long it takes somebody to go through a certain course and get a certain grade on a certain test, we'll be able to look at people's performance in relative skills and be able to project how long it will take them to reach their goal by going through the same course. And as I said, you can generate tons of data with the system, but the key is breaking it down and seeing how does this skill relate to another skill? Does learning one mean that you're going to be, which order should we learn the skills in? Because there's a lot of debate about that. Um, and, and just again, figuring out how to remember that, you know, teaching is a science in some ways, but it also very much is an art. And you have to, you know, certain teachers do better with certain students. You know, no one teacher is going to be able to teach everybody 100%. And our hope is that the system will not just turn, we don't want to make the trends that I think are negative in education worse by making everything too compartmentalized. I think you can go to, to an extreme with that as well. But we want to try to right. find the right balance between, you know, we're going to measure your growth, but at the same time, we don't want to stomp out your creativity. And, and ultimately, we want you to be self-motivated and self-guided in your own education. One area that we would love to see teachers use the system for is um, and I'm sure you, you would agree with this, one way to really know how to do something is to teach somebody else how to do it. Because then you have to think about the material you're teaching at a, I would say, a more metaphysical level. In other words, you're no longer trying to teach somebody how to, I mean, you know how to solve an equation, but in order to teach somebody else how to solve an equation, you have to think about the material at a higher level. And yet, you know, it's more effective if you put yourself in their shoes and try to say, what would this look like if I didn't understand what I was looking at? And that can guide you to your explanation of how to do certain things. And going through that process makes you so much better at understanding the material yourself than when you started. You know, I, I understand statistics so much better now that I've had to teach it to a whole bunch of high school students and college students. My understanding of statistics has gone through the roof. And um, at least the, the basic level statistics that I've had to teach. And what I'm hoping teachers will use Blickle for actually, ultimately, is for students to create lessons for each other on the system and go through each other's lessons because then you reach that creativity stage on Maslow's, I mean, not Maslow's hierarchy, on Bloom's hierarchy. And um, um, so I'm hoping that teachers will have students create lessons for each other on the system because that's a really effective way of, of teaching. You know, it's, it's, that's, that's really interesting, too, also because, you know, I, I've spent a lot of time, Matthias, I don't know if you have, but, but I personally have, and, and Gregory, I don't know if you have either, but I've spent a lot of time um, taking courses for things, uh, for continuing my own education. So I've taken a course here or there from Coursera that might have been sponsored by MIT or Stanford, right? And, and it mm -hmm. was maybe, a, a, you know, a computer class. Or maybe it wasn't, it might have just been a math class. It, 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 it went the gamut that I, I've personally taken. And what's really interesting about that is they refer the students always to like a, a forum, right, to, to share how they're solving a problem, but there's no software to use to show how you solve the problem. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So there's like, there, there's absolutely no way for, for, this, for, for somebody that wanted to teach me where I was stuck to actually kind of illustrate that, right? Mm -hmm. So then what happens is, is the students wind up taking the whole answer and just publishing it, which makes it kind of, you know, it's a self-taught way of, of solving a problem, right? To see if you, mm -hmm. if you kind of get the answer. But the issue is, is if you're, if you're not a student, you're, you may not study it, but 
it, it doesn't allow for someone to explain it creatively at all. And, and, and so I, I can see where I could have benefited from this two years ago completely um, so by letting someone teach it to me different than maybe maybe the way the question was asked or, or, and whatnot in, in some of those classes. Yeah, I 100% know where you're coming from. I've taught online classes before, and I, it's, at least in my experience, it's challenging to get students to talk to each other in an online environment because I think, right. it, I think everybody is really focused on themselves and getting through the class. And um, one, this is an idea that we have. Our, our vision for Blickle is and this won't be available in the first release because it, it's hard to code. <laughs> but eventually when we have a little bit more money and I can hire a couple more programmers, our intention is, you know how when you're on um, some social media sites and they have the chat off to the side of all the people who are currently online, our hope is that yes. you can put yourself behind an anonymous avatar if you want or be under your real name. And you can be in rooms with people who are studying the same material that you are and that you can ask questions in these chats, more like a chat than a forum, ask questions to the chat and um, as pe people will be able to guide you and answer your questions. And when they do that, you'll be able to reward them, incentivize them with an upvote or something so that people will be a little bit incentivized to help because there's whole Reddit forums, for example, that are just dedicated to helping people learn math. I know because I like to go on there and help people with math just because I enjoy doing it. And as you said, it's, you don't want somebody to just give you the answer. You want them to give you enough hints to help you get to the answer, but to at least try to figure it out on your own. And our hope is that volunteer moderators will want to sit in these chats and make sure that people aren't just cheating and, uh, and that there will be incentives for people to want to help. You know, as I said in the programmer game that we made, your level was based on how good your math was, I mean how good you were at programming. And our hope is that we can convert how high up you go in math to a level so that you can be, you know, you can have a certain level and see how what somebody else's level in math is compared to yours and watch your level grow until you surpass the people that were helping you at that one point. That's a wonderful model, actually. That's, that's so interesting. I have a completely unrelated question for you, but I think I, think, I want to get your thoughts on it because you're so passionate about math and you're sitting at the crux between, you know, with coding. Um, I, you know, I've got a background in accounting and I, I don't mean to say it that way, but what I found is I found a, an amazing similarity between the accounting accounting philosophy, just accounting in general, specifically double entry accounting and coding. And I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Do you ever see that, you know, debits and credits, right? Um, so if, mm -hmm. in accounting we speak, I guess. But the interesting thing about that math is that um, uh, when you look at, when you look at teaching people to code, it's, it's, it's surprisingly simpler. And I found it, I found it an easy technique to teach software. Have you seen that? I, 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 yeah, and I found that when I, the key is to start in a very safe environment where you're, you're teaching them just the very basics and you only slowly add on to it step at a time. Uh, I, I couldn't have learned how to code without my math background. And what I found is as I was learning how to code, you know, you learn variables. Well, I know what those are. And then you learn what a loop is. And I'm like, well, a loop is just a summation. I already know what that is. And thanks to my math background, I was able to, I think, learn it more quickly than somebody who didn't have a strong math background. But I mean, in my programming game that we made, you only ha you have to get the answers exactly right in order to pass through the levels. And I've had hundreds and hundreds of people go through about 75 10 part lessons without help just self-motivated. And if you teach it one little piece at a time so that it's just within their grasp to move to the next step, uh, people can learn even something very difficult like coding and, um, or the rules of accounting or the rules of engineering. And the, the crazy dream, as Jim Collins would call it, the big hairy goal is 
we're very concerned about the fact that automation is going to be replacing jobs very quickly and in a very disruptive way. And our hope is that what Blickle is going to someday ultimately become is to remove the middleman between employers and those seeking education. You know, I have a friend who works for a major manufacturing company, and I asked my friends, what percent of your degree do you actually use on a day-to-day -day basis at your manufacturing company? Because uh, this person's a mechanical engineer. And the person told me only about 10% of my actual stuff I learned in college for engineering do I actually use on a day-to-day -day basis. And so um, my, my thought is, well, what if we take that 10%, put, it in, put the company that's hiring the people in charge of that 10% so that they'll, they won't even need to interview people. They'll see their skill sets and know what they know. I mean, of course, they will interview people. But the point is, is that put the employers more in control of what the education needs are, what kind of employees they need, and partner with Blickle to help them do that. And then people will be able to complete courses for companies and, and just move from job to job as the job market becomes more disruptive. And, and since it's on the internet, it'll be flat. I was, I was just going to say there's a tremendous efficiency that you would gain if, if you could cut that 90% off. Um, imagine the agility with, with which um, the workforce would be able to adapt to, to technological changes or you know, just other economic changes. I 100% agree. And I have to be a little bit careful here because it's not that that other 90% is not valuable. And indeed, we do want people to have a well-rounded education. A big piece of that 90% though is separating applicants out. Who are the, who are the 4.0 engineers and who are the barely scraping by 2.1 engineers? But so there is that component of it too. And indeed, Blickle could say, you know, here's the skills you know, here's the skills you don't know. Um, but what we really want to do is reinvent math, what, what math class is. And I say math, but this could be applied to any subject. We really want to reinvent what math class is. Because the way math class is, is you take algebra one, then you take geometry, then you take college algebra, then you take trig, then you take pre-calculus, then you take calculus. But when you're a teacher and you have 25 students who are at 25 sometimes, sometimes a, a very high variance between those students. It's, it's almost, I, I have not yet figured out how to keep the people in the back getting caught up to everybody else while simultaneously not holding back the students that are at the top. And what Blickle does is it kind of changes the dynamic of a math class. Instead of college algebra or instead of taking trig, you just take math class. And at the extreme, what that would look like is, 25 students working on their homework, completing their lessons, who might be at completely different places in their math. One student might already be to pre-calculus while another student is still in Algebra 1. However, they're all making progress. They're all moving forward. I have students who sometimes just barely do not pass one of my classes, and unfortunately, the current system forces them to start that class over again. And that's a recipe for making somebody hate math, to have to, when they already don't, 100% understand it, and now you're making them do it all over again a second time. Instead, imagine if I have one student who is only able to complete 40% of the material by the time the semester ends, but it's okay because the class is called math class, and so instead they just take math class again, and they pick up right where they left off, whereas another student might already get to trig or might already get way ahead. So it might take one student only three quote-unquote math classes, to get all their college math credits, whereas another one, it might take six. But the point is, is that they're not being penalized for being a little bit slower than the person next to them. Everybody's moving in the right direction. I think philosophically speaking, I think, I think you've kind of hit the crux of the problem in a really magnificent way. I have to say, and, and the reason I say that is because you're right. It's, people get stuck on something and they get it's usually a simple concept and to allow them that that latitude to kind of come back and approach it from a couple different sides with just a basic math right gives them that mm -hmm. latitude to get that skill they're missing and you'll probably that within going through that again you'll troubleshoot that skill that's underdeveloped and build it back up and allow them to kind of excel 
But I think the broader picture of what you've developed here is more profoundly, and if you correct me if I'm wrong, but what I think you've kind of developed here is a way to problem solve growth in a position in a changing, I want to say it's a changing job economy, right? So for example, I think, I think what we're seeing with a lot of upper management positions and if well, I, anything, I think we could say probably, probably from a senior level position up in most organizations, um, whether they're in technology or not, just take any sector. I think what you kind of have developed here is a bridge between um, qualifying somebody's standards to see where they're at educationally, but also a stop gap to help them get the skills they need to keep going without, without saying this person won't fit the mold moving forward, which is not a solution we have today in the workplace, I don't think. And let, correct me if I'm wrong. And, and there's a lot of aptitude tests to say this person is not going to ever, ever get this. But what you actually have is a, is a problem-solving capability to get that person over the hump. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And it's, it's, it's simply a matter of time. One of the things I oftentimes tell my students who very frequently lack perspective, and I say that as somebody who myself, when I was a student, lacked perspective. I, I saw this on a motivational poster, so I can't take credit for it. But one of my favorite quotes is, do you know why I have a master's degree in math and you are in college algebra? Do you know why that is? And the reason is because I have failed <laughs> this material more times than you have even attempted it. <laughs> and it's true. It's true. So yeah. stop whining like that you didn't that. get an A on your test and just realize that getting something wrong is a necessary part of learning the right way how to do it. And, yeah. and you know, you're only going to make that mistake probably six times before you never make that mistake again. So we just got through the first time. You're probably going to do it a couple more times, but then you won't make the mistake again. And, and so stop worrying about your grade on this test. Let's just see what we didn't get. Let's recoup, you know, and let's, you know, let's incentivize hard work and because that's how life is. You get rewarded for hard work. And so let's incentivize that. I, I let students in my classes retake a test if they get a 100% on all their homework because, again, I want to incentivize hard work and getting all the problems correct. And it's okay if it takes a couple times, but you, you can, anybody can master this material and it's just a matter of practice and practicing it and learning and approaching the material from a new direction. But the, the best part about Blickle, though, is, you know, we've invested all of our time in building this platform. Uh, there's actually not a lot of content on it right now. We've written a bunch of pre-algebra math lessons, but that's about it. It's really just an empty platform right now. But what I'm hoping, my dream, is that like Wikipedia, people are going to jump into the platform see how easy it is to make content, and we'll just create their own content. And we might just see this flourishing platform of educational content that you will be able to rate and give feedback to. And so people will be able to adjust their lessons and fix errors that they may make. And they'll also get kind of broad analytics of people going through their content so that they'll be able to see where people get stuck and maybe make adjustments at that point. And so we're just really hoping that like the way Wikipedia flourished, like the way YouTube flourished uh, with people uploading all their videos, we're just hoping that, that Blickle will have a chance to scale and have people come in and, and make you know, content for, for their friends, for their students, for, for the community. That is a beautiful <laughs> vision. It really is. Well, thank you. We're, we're, we try to stay realistic about the financials of this idea. Certainly it's conceivable that we will go a while without being profitable, uh, just like many other major websites have. Um, we, we've currently structured the site in a way that it's easier for businesses to put in and organizations to put in training materials so that we can maybe target businesses with continuing education needs or human resources needs to use the sites to maybe earn a little bit of revenue as we continue development. But as you said, it's a tall order. It could quickly 
snowball beyond our ability to keep up with it. So we're, we're kind of hoping that happens, but obviously with that comes some trepidation too. <laughs> So, so Gregory, earlier you mentioned something about you mentioned your interest in helping students, uh, you know, get ready for the the changing workforce. And the story that you told about that guy uh, who who reached out to you about um, his computer science degree definitely, I don't know, that's a story that just sticks with you. Um, I know you've been heavily involved with, with the internship program here, um, taking a deep interest in the in the PTech grant here. Um, Love to hear a little bit of your thoughts about the future of you know, rural tech, especially for some of these some of these students in high school and, and community college. Absolutely, it's, it's really exciting. I think I, the as you can imagine, I really enjoy bringing on interns, and because I, I'm a teacher, I, I enjoy teaching people, and all of the interns who work for Blickle. Uh, get real world experience, how to learn basic code, how to make a basic website, uh, how to, you know, some interns are able to get that far. Other interns who spend time at home studying away from work are even able to make simple games by the time their internship is over. And it's, it's the internet just has, it, it's, although the internet through certain companies has centralized a lot of wealth, like especially when you consider things like retail and uh, you know the online shopping, taking some of the money out of communities, the opportunity for learning, I think, is a way to once again get that some of that wealth recirculated back through rural America. And you know the the, the opportunities are out there for people to learn the skills to get very in demand, high paying jobs, not necessarily just in coding but in, in all sorts of fields. And it, it, they, they just need an opportunity. There was somebody at, yesterday at the Friday meeting who said, where do I go to learn how to start doing this stuff? And I coughed a blickle under my breath and everybody laughed because you know, it, it is an opportunity as long as you've got internet. And that is a challenge in some communities. You know, when I was teaching in New Mexico, I had a bunch of wonderful students who unfortunately didn't even have internet at home. But, you know, the, the places where the internet isn't available are getting smaller and smaller. And, you know, what, what, I really think that a, a websites like Blickle, websites that flatten education for everybody, create opportunities for people who can't afford to go to college, create opportunities for people who are far away or are unable to leave home and eventually, ultimately, could lead to a way to get money recirculated back through rural com communities that are suffering a little bit because of um, the way that some certain sectors of wealth have been created that have shifted the landscape out from under everybody, especially small businesses. Yeah, and I think what you see is some of those some of those capital intensive businesses have become kind of fortified by by the internet, but intellectual, um, you know, assets can be transferred so quickly because of the internet and, and it really has lowered the barriers for rural communities to, to play the game there. That's right. And we do intend in our big plan to become accreditized um, and be able to actually hand out meaningful uh, certifications, meaningful someday, maybe even degrees at a much, much, much lower cost than what, current institutions of higher education charge. And another thing we're really proud of is our, our efforts at every single level to make Blickle meet the highest standards of um, disability accommodation so that truly anybody that has a computer, at least, uh, can use the system to further their education and not be limited in any way by disability. I think I think what you have here is just such an incredible tool. And you know, Matthias specifically to to the P Tech programs that and the internships, but even more so, um, the education I, I think and I'm gonna go out on a limb here and it's okay if nobody agrees with me. Um, I think I think what we've seen as far as higher education 
um, happen because of the internet. I think I think the whole view of college and getting master's degrees and, and learning a trade, I think the whole higher education system is a little bit different than it was maybe 10, 15 years ago, specifically in a rural community, right? Um, and what I think is so magical about the work that, Gregory, you're doing and, and the impact you're having on the high school and the impact that you're having on the interns um, is, is that you're, you have this incredible tool and it's based around math and that's fantastic, but you are teaching critical thinking skills and you're allowing a platform to bridge this really hard gap, which I think it is going to exist. It exists in, in, in business and in technology. It's, it's an ongoing shift. We see this going in certain age groups, even in the workplace, this, this bridge of how am I going to continue to grow and how am I going to morph into the position that I have? Because the technology is changing the way the jobs are. It's happening year over year. Every job is a little bit different because of, of what technology has done for us. But you've got a tool that can live with the community. It can live, live with that. And, and, and for a rural community, it's an instant miracle worker. It's like, it's like having a B12 uh, vitamin pump in you all the time because you've got the answer right, right there. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I think it, it could revolutionize a workforce. Is, is kind of my vision. Am I wrong in, in thinking of that, Matthias? What do you think? Yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree. I, I think one of the fascinating um, kind of strands or some of the fascinating strands through this conversation for me have been these kind of philosophical shifts that are pretty countercultural. Um, this is jumping way back, but Gregory, you talked about um, pursuing mastery rather than just a short-term achievement and, and going for long-term effects of education instead of just short-term. And, and I, as I look at some of those philosophical, maybe even cultural shifts, um, I, I think it ties in with what you're saying too, Ashley, is that, that these things really do have the, the opportunity to turn things on the head, on, on its head as, you know, life as we know it, education as we know it, and, and really unlocking opportunities for rural, uh, for rural communities. Well, I'll tell you what, I am going to be anxious to watch this play out for the next couple quarters, Gregory, I'll tell you, because I think you're sitting on the solution. I really do. Because I, I would, I, and I would venture to say, and this is my metaphysical Ashley business world personality coming out, I would say the biggest skill needed across everything at the moment in every community is critical thinking, right? I'd go, there, I'd go right there, and I see you. And I, and I say that because I'm just as passionate about math probably as you are secretly. No one knows that because I'm <laughs> awful at math. I'm awful at math. If you ask me to do a math problem, I will, I will glom it up. I promise you. That's <laughs> because you need blickle. That's, that's, uh, that's, that's all awesome. <laughs> Plan on me signing up too. That's, that's step two for me. But having said that, um, this, the, the fact that this can address that, that perspective of critical thinking in in terms of relating the material back is so huge to me. I just I just believe this this could really really be a game changer in communities that can't get the education in place right away. I'll give you a perfect example. I was working um, and I hate to use myself, but I went I went to the community college here to try to find some classes in computer science help me because I was consulting with data scientists in rural Colorado, right? Consulting mm -hmm. for firms in New York and, and also firms in San Francisco. And I was meeting with chief engineers and I had nowhere to go to understand what these people were talking about, literally, right? So I was trying to explain business concepts, which was very easy to a bunch of math people, right? For, I'm sure mm -hmm. there's another word for the mathematicians I, and programmers, and I didn't have the language necessary to bridge to bridge that gap because I'm not a math person. I'm just not, and I'm not a programmer either, to be perfectly honest with you. But at the time, I could have easily gone to Blickle and said, teach me the math used in this field so I can have an intelligent conversation. Because at the time, mm -hmm. there there was no 
textbook to say, okay, um, in, in big data and analytics, you know, what's the standard deviation mean in, in terms of, you know, a use case for, for monetizing data? There was no place to go find mm -hmm. that data, right? And this was maybe five years ago, but if you had Blickle five years ago, I would have been able to communicate that because I, there I was on Coursera's platform and, you know, I, I signed up for the Stanford class in, uh, I forget what it was, but it was something I can't even pronounce. <laughs> I can tell you that much. And um, I, 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 no, I kid you not, and I didn't have any of the prerequisites, right? So I spent $500 on this class to try to understand how my colleagues were thinking. And this was how I approached the problem. I went to the community college here, um, and I think I wound up going to Buena Vista, to CMC to try to get some support to understand what I needed to go learn right because I had no idea and it was simply math but I had no idea it was that and so again there was no one in the community for me to speak to um, to learn what I didn't know or to point me in the direction and there was no career counselor at a big 10 school either I tell mm -hmm. you because the field I went into was emerging so that's why what you've done is is such a gorgeous product. It's just beautiful. It's beautiful. Well, I, I, it's going to change so much some lives. It's 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 what I think I was put on earth to build. Honestly, the, when I was making life choices, and I thought, do I want to pursue a PhD in math? Mm, it didn't appeal to me that much. Uh, being a like I, I love being a teacher, and I still am. But I wanted to expand my potential impact. And what's fun is I think the entire world right now is struggling with information overload. And what I think yes. Liquid can do is help provide a little bit of structure around some of that information and allow people the ability to, as you said, when you were trying to take this class and learn the correct vernacular or learn the correct definitions, it's a tool where you can provide some structure. And what's fun is we've developed the tools so that if you're making your own lessons, it's real easy for you to add on a collaborator and bring them on to help you edit your lessons. And we, we give the tools to the people to make their content the way they want to make it. And, um, and so that's why we say that it's a te it, Blickle is a website built by teachers for teachers. But it's really not just for teachers. It's for anybody who wants to try to explain something to somebody else. It's evolutionary because you, you allow the lesson to evolve. How many people don't allow that? That's genius. I just think, mm -hmm. I just think this is the most amazing thing ever. I don't know, Matthias. I, I, think, I think we're going to have some rock stars coming out of this. <laughs> I just think. I really think we're this really, is something special. Well, I'm really glad you hear that. Anybody right now actually can go on to Blickle.com, create an account, and actually start making content. There's still some bugs in the system, and um, we're shooting by the middle to the end of this month for it to be firing on, on pretty much on all cylinders. And we're going to be adding more math lessons, um, adding more features. And as I said, you might go there and wonder where all the content is. And all I ask is for a little bit of patience because at one point Wikipedia was in the same boat. So you go to Wikipedia and where are all the articles? Uh, and our hope is that we've made the platform fun enough to use, intuitive, and uh, that people will just want to make stuff so that they can share it with their friends. So if, if one of the best contributions that people can do is just get on the platform and start using it and start um, contributing content to it, is that? Absolutely. Is that right? in, in parallel yeah. with the content that we're going to be creating. And yeah. we've gotten to the point where the updates that we can do preserve people's data so nobody should lose data. Even though the site will be updated, nobody should fear that they're going to lose data that they put into the system. Oh, wait. So I'm sorry, Ms. I just have to say this because I came up with something <laughs> that's crazy. So technically, what we could do, Gregory, is, you know, you hear Brad and, and myself and if at our quarterly meetings we're talking about how the upper arc technology sector is becoming kind of a model for other rural areas to follow. So technically, mm -hmm. we could use Blickle to tell our story one day, right? Absolutely. Or can you imagine 
taking the course from the Upper Arkansas Technology of how to build your own partnership. And you just there go, go through and learn Boom. the skills and learn the timeline. And, and be connected to the person who made the course. So if you want to ask follow-up questions, you'd be able to communicate directly to that person. And once Matthias, we get there's those our questions, solution. Then, we'll, then we'll put the uh, answer right into the course and won't have to be asked that question again. And it exactly. just keeps getting better. <laughs> that's, that's one of my so, favorite there we go. Features, is when you, when you create a lesson and add it to something that you've already built. And we're, in fact, next week, we're building the notification system so that anybody who's already subscribed to that unit or to that course will get a notification that a lesson has been added and so that they can go and complete that, that new lesson. Sure. So once, once there are thousands of these little uh, technology sectors across, across the U.S. and across the globe, um, Ash and Gregory, we can point back to this podcast and, and – uh, there's, here, here's where this we part of it said started. it first. Just saying, we said it first. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, it, it, you're right, and it means a lot to me to hear your excitement because you know we still have a lot of work to do. Uh, it's still in an early phase of development, but we, we are we have a really big vision of what we call crowdsourcing education, and and making it so that everybody can be simultaneously the teacher and the student. Yeah. Cool. Good. And, and, we'll and to just wrap up on your thought about critical thinking, critical thinking is usually one of the number one goals of an educator. However, it's very difficult to measure and very difficult to teach. Mm -hmm. And to just kind of put a bow on how we operate is I, I go back to the old saying of if you need to get your people to build a boat or to build a ship, you don't want to teach them how to hammer nails. You don't want to teach them how to put up a sail. Instead, it's much more effective to just teach them an endless longing for the sea. And that and is a wonderful way to say that. Oh, that's beautiful. That is a beautiful thought. I'm going to hold on to that one today. <laughs> I couldn't have said that better myself. That's awesome, Gregory. That is a wonderful way to teach. That's just amazing. Well, thank you. <laughs> Good. Well, wow. I, I mean, I think that sounds like a fantastic, uh, fantastic way to wrap up this interview. Um, any, any closing thoughts, Gregory? Anything? <laughs> if you're looking yeah. Well, you just, stop that. <laughs> <laughs> well, if anybody. I know. Wants to I'm like, I just more. totally went brain dead. <laughs> we, can't, we can't stop that. Sorry, Ian. Go ahead. <laughs> 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 if anybody would like to learn more, they can email me at Gregory, G-R-E-G-O-R-Y, at Blickle.com. Blickle is B-L-I-C-K-E-L. We're, we're open to feedback on the system. We're open to uh, hear what people like, what they don't like. And we've been sitting on it for probably longer than we should have been, but that's because you only get really one chance to really throw your thing out there. Um, if you ever want to talk to me again, we have some really creative uh, marketing ideas, including reaching out to YouTube creators who have already made lots of educational videos and reaching out to them and saying, hey, host some of your content on Blickle and, uh, or at least connect it, and uh, we can share some of the revenue that we make as people sign up with your promo code. We, we have a lot of unconventional marketing ideas beyond just the traditional ads to, to to market it. So we're hoping the tool is so good that people just want to use it. That, that's our goal. That's, that's fantastic. And, and I, I do think this will, this will be an interesting um, project to, to return to in a future interview. So it's been awesome having you, having you on the show and thanks for, for what you're doing in, in, uh, in the tech start, the broader tech start community and what you're doing in the, in the world of education. We appreciate your contribution. Well, thank you so much for having me. I've really enjoyed this. And uh, thanks for all your excellent questions. And uh, I, I, I really hope that people, anybody listening to this can feel more optimistic about the tremendous opportunities that are out there for rural areas and to figure out, for rural areas to figure out how they can get their claws into tech and make it part of their economy and part of, uh, part of their community. Thanks for listening to the Techstart podcast. Find out more at techstart.fremontedc.com.